over the internet, but it sounds great. All right, number 333, His Way With Thee. 333. Oh, uh -huh. 
Thank you so much, Miss Debbie. Thank you for all the singing. It's, what a blessing. Um, as you can see, um, I'm up here. We have uh, Pastor Roser uh, are on vacation. They're on their crazy road trip <laughs> uh, for three weeks. And so they, as far as I can tell, they should be in San Antonio, Texas. So uh, please lift them up in prayer as they have a wonderful adventure. I've seen some pictures, so they're well underway. Uh, the Schumans are on a cruise in Alaska, so pray for them as well. Uh, I understand there was an 8.2 magnitude earthquake in the Alaska vicinity, so hopefully that didn't affect them at all. <laughs> <laughs> a little, just a little way, right? <laughs> what was that? But yeah, I understand there were like tsunami warnings and they, they called you off and so forth. But. And then the deers, I know, are uh, in Ohio. They are, uh, they seized, they went to the Ark Encounter, and they are uh, at the Creation um, Museum, and they'll be hanging out this week. But uh, we got some scripture reading we wanted to get to, and so if you could turn to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, and then put your finger and go to Ecclesiastes 3, 1, and 4. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4. And if we could stand for the reading of, the, of God's Word, we're going to let the gentleman read. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4, or 3, 1, 4. Uh, to everything that there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. All right, thank you. Let's, let's open our prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for your word, Lord, and Lord, uh, may we dive into it and uh, see your wonders, Lord, and Lord, just how amazing it is to be created in your image, Lord, and Lord, uh, may today we just look at one little aspect of, of that, and Lord, may you be glorified uh, today, Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. May it be your words, not mine, Lord, and uh, Lord, may you have your way. We lift you up in Jesus' name. All right, maybe see you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so we are God's crown jewel. We're made in his, his image. And that's just fascinating, right? Just to know that he created us. And out of all the things in the whole universe, he created us in his image. Now, last time I knew, I am not omnipotent. I am not all-powerful. I'm not omnipresent. So, uh, well, how does that relate? How am I created? How is that the image of God? Well, clearly, we are not God. <laughs> but God has given us his wonderful attributes, his wonderful attributes. And so we can see that in the fruit of the Spirit, anything that's just wonderful, patient, and good, and kind, and generous, and all the image of God. One, one aspect of the image of God we want to look, like, look at today is laughter. How many of you love to laugh? Just love to laugh, right? Just love to laugh. Well, God loves to laugh, too. And, you know, that's just something, it's just a special gift he gave us, right? To laugh. Of course, that could be taken go the wrong direction, and laughing at not the right things, and for you know the wrong reasons and so forth. But clearly, we have the ability to laugh, and somehow I have to think that is part of uh, the attributes of being created in His image. We saw in Ecclesiastes that there is a time to laugh. There is a time to laugh. So, as you may suspect, I'm going to start off this uh, sermon with a bunch of corny jokes, <laughs> just to uh, lighten things up. Uh, this is, I'm probably stepping on thin water here, or thin ice here, and uh, will probably fall flat on my face with this, but you ready? <laughs> you ready? All right, so what kind of man was Boaz before he got married? What kind of man was Boaz before he got married? He was ruthless. He was ruthless. <laughs> he was ruthless. <laughs> Why is that coming from you, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> you were the same as Boaz. <laughs> you know. I'm sorry, Ruby. It's okay. <laughs> oh. All right. Here's another little story here. In Sunday school, they were 
teaching how God created everything, including human beings. Little Johnny seemed especially intent when they told him how Eve was created out of one of Adam's ribs. Later in the week, his mother noticed him lying down as he were ill and said, Johnny, what's the matter? Little Johnny said, I have a pain in my side. I think I'm going to have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> Another one here. A little boy opened the big and old family Bible with fascination and looked at the old pages as he turned them. Suddenly something fell out of the Bible and he picked it up and looked at it closely. It was an old leaf from a tree that had been pressed between the pages. Mama, look what I look what I have found, the boy called out. What have you got there, dear? His mother asked. With astonishment, the young boys answered a voice he answered. I think it's Adam's suit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a question. What is a dentist's favorite hymn? What is a dentist's favorite hymn? Something to do with crowns? Crown with the many crowns. Crown with the many crowns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell me you've been crowned. <laughs> A couple had two little boys, ages 8 and 10, who were excessively mischievous. The two were always getting into trouble, and their parents could be assured that if any mischief occurred in their town, their two youngs were in some way involved. The parents were at their wit's end as to what to do about their son's behavior. The mother heard that a pastor in town had been successful at disciplining children in the past, so she asked her husband if he thought they should send the boys to speak with this pastor. The husband said, we might as well. We need to do something before I really lose my temper. The pastor agreed to speak with the boys, but asked to see them individually. The eight-year-old went to meet with them first. The pastor sat down, the, the, the pastor sat the boy down and asked him sternly, where is God? The boy made no response, so the pastor repeated the question in even stern, sterner tone. Where is God? Again, the boy made no attempt to answer, so the clergyman raised his voice even more and shook his finger in the boy's face. Where is God? At that, the boy bolted from the room and ran directly home, sla home slamming himself in the closet. His older brother followed him into the closet and asked what had happened. The younger brother replied, we're in big trouble. <laughs> God is missing, and I think we did it. <laughs> 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 All right, the question, what kind of car does Jesus typically drive? Anyone? A Chrysler. Oh. A Chrysler. Oh. <laughs> All right, last story here, last story. A teacher asked her Sunday school class to draw pictures of their favorite Bible stories. She was puzzled by a boy's picture which showed four people on an aircraft, so she asked him which story it was meant to represent. The flight to Egypt, he replied. I see, and that must be Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, she said. But who's the fourth per person? Oh, that's Pontius the pilot. Uh, no. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Then. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, so Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. What an immense honor it is to have the features of God, to be like him. If we have a sense of humor, then the one who created us has a sense of humor as well. You know, I have proof God has a sense of humor. Just look at me. <laughs> Besides my looks, I was born five weeks premature and on April Fool's Day. You think any of my parents' friends believed them when they said we had a baby? They said, no, they just laughed and said, oh, April Fool's, April Fool's, you're joking with us. 
So I started my, my life in laughter. <laughs> now you see that five weeks premature, it has stunted my grip. <laughs> so God certainly has a sense of humor. So I was thinking about this, you know, laughter is a part of an image of God, and laughter is fun, and, you know, it just brings joy, and we enjoy being around people where we're laughing, and it's contagious. But have you ever pondered, what am I laughing at? Why do we laugh? Have you pondered that? So, of course, you know, what we do these days, we ask Google, uh, do so, you know, why do we laugh? You know, that sort of thing. So then uh, Google comes up with the mechanics and starts giving articles about how your ribs go in and out and air comes out and stuff like that. And that, that's how those animal-like sounds are just leftovers from millions and millions of years of evolution, which I then laugh at. <laughs> you know, that is not what I was looking for. That was not the intention of my question. But what kind of things make us laugh? So I started a mental note any time I laughed. What caused me to laugh? What was the trigger that made me laugh? Why was I laughing? And then, all right, turn on a sitcom and they got the canned laughter or whatever. What kind of things did they trigger that laughter on? What, what, was, the, what was going on there? Or, and then I asked some friends, you know, why do we laugh? Why do we laugh? Well, I got some shocking news for you. We laugh at silly things. We laugh at silly things. Mm -hmm. Well, what is silly? Well, basically, we laugh at things that are absurd. Things that are absurd, right? Kind of, if you think about it, kind of encompasses things that we laugh at, right? Absurd means wildly unreasonable, illogical, and inappropriate sometimes, right? Wildly unreasonable, illogical. One scientist uh, that I was researching came up with what he calls the benign violation theory. Benign violation theory. In other words, we laugh at things that come up with two criteria. We laugh at a situation that goes against the unexpected, right? It's, not, it's absurd, right? It goes against the unexpected, uh, what we expect, and nobody gets hurt. And nobody gets hurt. In other words, if I come up here and all of a sudden trip and fall, you may like <gasps> gasp, but as soon as I get up and everything's fine, you may laugh, mm -hmm. right? No one was hurt. This wildly motion over here, you know, uh, is just, just abnormal, right? It's absurd. And so that causes us to laugh. And of course, you're not getting hurt either, so it's something to laugh at. You know, we, uh, um, I get scared, honestly, when Pastor does one of these big leg kicks up here, like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be careful, we don't want anybody hurt, because that's not funny. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's doing things to cause us to laugh, cause us to think, cause us to generate a, generate a response. We know full well that knocking somebody over the head with a frying pan may give someone brain damage, right? Like when the Three Stooges are doing it, we laugh because it's cartoon violence. Uh, it's benign, it's a benign violation. We know Mo, Larry, and Curly are only fictional characters, so therefore they feel no pain. And, you know, we watch these sitcoms and they do all kinds of crazy actics and hit, you know, uh, hit somebody over the frying pan and they fall over, fall in the chair, and the chair breaks and all kinds of stuff like that. In reality, someone's going to get hurt. But, you know, we see that it's a fictional character and they're getting up and moving on, and that's, that's funny, right? That's funny. That's what we laugh at. We love sports bloopers. We love sports bloopers. You know, so a baseball player running in and he crashes into the wall, or, or uh, someone tripping over somebody else, or colliding with another player. We like to watch sports bloopers. So, this past road trip, I uh, went to, able to take the boys to Fenway Park in Boston. And if anybody knows, Boston fans are a unique bunch. A unique bunch. They uh, they don't hold back, right? They <laughs> they don't hold back. So the uh, one in the innings uh, between um, between the innings uh, between the between the plays there, right? They showed on the big screen bloopers. Oh, that's fun watching bloopers and so forth. 
You know what I began to notice about these bloopers? It was all about the Kansas City Royals. That's the team where they were playing. There was no other team. It was the Kansas City Royals that they were showing bloopers on. <laughs> How mean can that be? <laughs> Not just general baseball bloopers, only that team. <laughs> oh, oh my, oh my. All right, you know, the, the Bible, any of you read through it, there are some funny stories in the Bible. Funny stories. Probably many times we read through the Bible and we're taking things seriously. We're trying to grasp, grasp you know, what God's trying to tell us through the story. And, but really, if you step back and look at it, it is a funny story. It's a funny story. For instance, let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 16. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. God is talking to Abraham about Sarah. So put this in context. Verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said, And so shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Abraham laughed. <laughs> Jump to verse 19. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Notice, notice who named the baby. God did, right? God named Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? Laughter. Laughter. <laughs> Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Genesis chapter 18, jump there, verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the man or woman. There's no way she can have a baby, right? Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being all old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child with which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. For she was afraid, and he says, Nay, but thou didst laugh. But thou didst laugh. Jump to Genesis chapter 21, verse 5. Genesis chapter 21, verse 5. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him, and Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh within, with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, or have borne him a son in his old age? Why is this story funny? Yeah. It's absurd, right? It's absurd. And it's probably funny to us because we're not the one that's going to have a baby at 90 years old. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Millie came up and announced they're going to have a baby, we'd all laugh. So, you're kidding, right? <laughs> it's absurd, right? Sarah says, God made me laugh. Notice that Sarah, Sarah says, God made me laugh so that others will laugh also. God made me laugh so others will laugh also. You know, this tells us that God is in the business of the absurd to show us that nothing is too hard for him. Right? 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 Isn't that fun? He's in the business of doing some wacky things so we can see him. We can see him. Think about these other stories. Jonah and the big fish. Jonah getting swallowed by the big fish and then three days later being in it out on the land. Clearly, this is funny because you're not in the fish. <laughs> no, Jonah chapter 2, verse 10, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the land. Just thinking about that, right? Just, it's absurd to be swallowed by a fish. And then be vomited out. 
Uh, we've heard some stories of this sort of thing happening. Nobody that we know of lasted three days that I'm aware of, but uh, there was one recently up there in Massachusetts this past summer that was swallowed, and then the uh, I think it was a whale. It was a whale. It was a whale. Mm -hmm. um, didn't like what was in him and immediately spit him out. But the guy was in there long enough to recognize where he was. All right, another funny story. David and Goliath. David and Goliath. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 42 says, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. In other words, mocked him, laughed at him. For he was but a youth, a ruddy, and of fair countenance. Here comes this short little kid coming up to this Goliath. Well, what are you doing? You're sending this guy out to us? So Goliath is laughing at him. All the Philistines are laughing at them. This is a no-brainer. This guy is going to be destroyed, right? Smushed. Smushed with his little pinky. So clearly you can hear the laughter and mockery from the Philistine side as they see this kid going to fight Goliath. The Philistines weren't laughing for long. <laughs> the Israelites were laughing, laughing soon after that. Alright, how about this one? Do you remember the story about Elijah, the 450 false prophets of Baal? Uh, both Elijah, Elijah challenged the false prophets of Baal to build an altar on Mount Carmel. And they had asked that their god, Baal, should throw fire down on the altar. And then Elijah will ask God to throw fire on the altar. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 26. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 26. And they took the bullock which was with, given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning, morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Now they're doing crazy things, trying to get Baal to do something. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or a peradventure he sleepeth. And must be awakened. Elijah's laughing at them. Where is your God? And he's leaping. Oh, come on. What is he doing? Is he talking to somebody else? Did he get distracted? Maybe he's on his phone texting. Where is he? Verse 27. And it came to pass at uh, noon. Cry aloud. Verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Well, that's really infuriating. And then they start, for some reason, they thought cutting themselves would help wake up Baal. Verse 29, it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Nothing happened. I mean, you all know why nothing happened, clearly. <laughs> Elijah must have been laughing the whole morning. Actually, it's probably really sad. Right? When you think about it, it's just sad. It's just absurd to call on a false god. Absurd. You know, we uh, read in books about, uh, or even Bible, about, uh, you know, carved images and bowing down to carved images. And, you know, for all of us who've been coming to church all our lives, it's kind of uh, a distant thing. It's just something we read about. But uh, going on a mission trips, you see it. And, like, how can this be? This is so absurd. Uh, we went, went to Trinidad. Uh, the, la the tallest or la biggest Hindu statue on the Western Hemisphere is down in Trinidad. And like, this is true stuff. People are bowing down to false images. It's absurd, right? It's something to laugh at. But really, you're crying down and deep inside. Verse 37, 1 Kings 18, 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the waters that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. He is the God. All right, what about the conversation between Balaam and the donkey? Well, that's a funny one. <laughs> Numbers 22, 27. You're not going to read the Bible the same way again. You're going to laugh through it. Aren't you? <laughs> Numbers 22, verse 27. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. So just a little backtrack of the story here. Balaam, he's basically a prophet for hire. 
If, uh, if I'm gonna, I could hire him and say, I want you to bless Israel, and then, then the king of Moab hires him and says, I want you to curse Israel. You can take the highest offer. <laughs> yes. yes, we're going to see the funniness of this. So this is what's going on here, right? So he's a prophet for hire. Now he's on his way to curse Israel when God told him, you will bless Israel. Okay? So that's where we pick up the story. So he's riding on a donkey going down, and the donkey falls. So she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the donkey with a staff. It's the donkey, right, for falling. And, and the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said, Unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou must have smitten me with these, these three times? Donkey turns around, why are you hitting me? <laughs> there comes that. Um, if that wasn't crazy, here comes the next crazy part. Verse 29, and Balaam said unto the donkey, <laughs> because thou hast mocked me, I would there have, were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. <laughs> So Balaam then responds saying, if I had a sword, I would have killed you for doing what you did. Verse 30, and the donkey said unto Balaam, am I not thine donkey upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, nay. That was Balaam. <laughs> <laughs> Then the Lord opened eyes of Balaam and saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine donkey these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the donkey saw me and turned from me these three times. And unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Right? This funny, this story is funny, it's absurd that a donkey is going to talk to you. And then absurd again that you're going to talk back and you're having a whole conversation with this animal, right? And here the Lord uses this absurdity to show you, he's protecting you. I am about to, I have the angel of the Lord about to kill you right here on the spot if you move any further and do something I told you not to do, right? The donkey is the one protecting you. All these amazingly absurd, absurd stories, Jonah and the whale, God told Jonah, you're going to go preach to Nineveh. If God's going to tell you to do something, guess what? You're going to do it. And if you're not going to do it, you may end up with something that's totally absurd to get you there. <laughs> All right, here's a, another funny one. Remember the time when the Ark of the Covenant that was stolen by the Philistines and taken to the temple of Dagon in the town of Ashdod? Is that familiar to anyone? 1 Samuel chapter 5. Verse 2, First Samuel chapter 5, verse 2. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him on his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both of the palms of his hands were cut off from the threshold. Only a stump of Dagon was left to him. So they steal the Ark of the Covenant. They put it in this temple here where there's these statues of this, this false god named Dagon. And they, they leave the Ark of the Covenant there. They walk out. They, they arrive the next morning. Guess what? That statue has fallen down. <laughs> they put him, arrive the statue again. And then they come the next morning, and guess what? Now the statue's kind of broken with palms and the stump and so forth, lying on the ground. Nothing's going to not glorify God, right? Just absurd. This thing is falling down. But God used that to say, there's something peculiar about this Ark of the Covenant. There's something different about this God than all the other gods that we worship. Maybe he's the one true God. All right, here's another one. This is dealing with Jesus. Um, there's a lady, a maid, that has died. Matthew chapter 9, verse 23. Matthew chapter 9, verse 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed at him to scorn. They laughed at him to scorn. This lady, as far as they knew, was dead. Jesus comes in and says, Nah, just sleeping. And they're laughing at him. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her hand, took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. 
the absurdity of the situation brought fame, right, to the Lord, brought glory to the Lord. So who had the last laugh? Who had the last laugh? God uses absurdity to draw people to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, the silly things, the absurd things of the world, to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Think of David and Goliath, right? Think of us. Verse 28, And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Dagon's not going to glory in God's presence. Right? The false prophets aren't going to glory in the Lord's presence. Verse 30, but of, Ma, of, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Isn't it fun to laugh at things that just give glory to God? I mean, that's the best laughter, right? Just, just, just the wonderful things. Jesus uses funny, absurd things in order to get his point across. He uses funny teaching tools, right? Teachers use humor to, to teach lessons. That's, well, I guess that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> he got his point across by making people see the ridiculousness of life. The ridiculousness of life. All right, so... This is, I was telling you some stories. These are now teaching aids. Uh, Jonathan, you want to come help me with this illustration here? And maybe you can figure out what passage I'm talking about. All right, just hold this up to your eye, but don't poke your eye. All right, does anybody know this illustration? <laughs> All right. No. Turn around so everyone can see. <laughs> right? The moat. The, the moat in the eye, right. The moat in the eye. Matthew, thank you, sir. Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. And again I say unto you, it is... Oh, well, uh, I'm back there. I messed up. Matthew 7, verse 3. And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? I should have brought a beam. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt clearly see clearly to cast out the moat in thy brother's eye. You know, we look at that and remind that, but Jesus is using a, a lesson of absurdity here, right? Mm -hmm. To recognize that anybody who's standing in a distance and seeing a little confrontation between, the, between two people can clearly see this person has really done so much more, and this guy's accusing this one? Absurd, right? <clears throat> All right, what about the eye of a needle? Eye of a needle. Matthew 19, 24, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry, I was looking for a camel. I couldn't bring it in for the illustration. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine a camel. Camels... A really large animal, yeah. right? So here's the eye of the needle. Anyone see the eye? Mm -hmm. Right? That's how absurd it is, right? This is, this is an illustration where God, Jesus is talking to the rich man who has all this money and basically tells him, you can't get on your own. You can't get on your own. There's no way. There's no way for this camel to go through that eye of the needle, right? So he's, Christ is using a lesson in absurdity to point out that there's no way for you to get there without him. So, the illustration is so absurd, that's the point Jesus is making. <laughs> right? He's making that point. He's used a, an exaggerated, humorous image to get his point across. What about salt? Matthew 5, 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, slave, savor wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Does salt ever lose its saltiness? Mm -hmm. Right? If, it's, if, it's, if it loses its salt, it's sand. It's not salt. Mm -hmm. Right? So telling me that salt loses its saltiness, that's absurd. Well, that's the same thing with a Christian, right? It's absurd for a Christian to not be living the life of a Christian.
Christian and pointing to Christ. Right? Don't lose your saltiness. Salt can't. <laughs> Salt can't. So think about this. Can salt ever lose its saltiness? Well, that's the point Christ is making about Christians. What about house on the sand? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things, sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was found upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of its fall of it. It's absurd not to build your house on a foundation. Right? That's the point. Build your house on a foundation. Look for the foundation. Look for the rock. Right? Build your house on the rock. Build your house on a foundation that will last. There's some pretty funny proverbs. Just a couple here I just want to point out. Here are two that picture a lazy man. Proverbs 22, 13, the, sloth, the slothful man saith, There's a lion outside! I'll be slain in the streets! I don't want to do anything. I don't want to get hurt by the lion outside. Clearly, is there a lion outside? No. You're just lazy. You're just lazy. Proverbs 26, 14, As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful man upon his bed. Does the door go anywhere? No, it stays right here. I almost knocked Brother Robert over. <laughs> <laughs> be, be careful, it was on the other side of the door. Uh -huh. You know, a fossil man, a lazy man, he's not doing nothing, he's just turning over bed. He's not going anywhere. Just like a door. Just like a door. So we got these teaching tools to show, man, I don't want to be lazy. I want to get up and be productive. <clears throat> we have seen how God uses silly things to, to point to himself, right? Point to himself. And silly things to teach us lessons. Now the point of the whole matter here is the Bible also tells us that God laughs at some pretty sad things that man does. And you know that man can do some pretty absurd things. You know, sometimes we, it's so sad that we have to laugh at it, right? So sad that our only reaction is like, laughter. Psalms chapter 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Anybody see a problem with that already? <laughs> and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. The Lord will be laughing at them. There you look down and see the plans of men. That is just absurd. How are you going to go... What makes you possibly think you can go against the Almighty, the creator of the universe, and you have plans to go against him? Absurd, right? Absurd. Clearly, this is really sad. God's laughing at it. <laughs> you guys don't understand. You've, you're clearly off the wrong track here. Psalm chapter 37, verse 12. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Oh boy, you're laughing now. You, I will have the last laugh. I will have the last laugh. You're plotting against the righteous. You're plotting against my own. I will have the last laugh. Boy, don't you just know what's going to be coming at you. Psalm 59, 8. But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. They're going to be mocking at all the heathen because yeah. they chose poorly. They had every opportunity and chose wrong. God laughs at the nations of the world as they want to fight God. He laughs at an individual who thinks he can get to heaven on his own. He laughs at a man who thinks he can do anything for himself without God. Let's think about